The Churchill tank. It was one of the most important British tank designs of World War II. But if I had to sum the Churchill story up in one sentence, I'd say it started badly, but ended well. Winston Churchill famously remarked, that is the tank they named after me when they found out it was no damn good. But like Churchill, following an unpromising start, it would prove to be a stubborn yet robust machine with plenty of stamina in navigating difficult terrain. In spite of their weight, they're able to move over any kind of ground at a great speed. What kind of headlines will they produce when they go into action en masse? This video has been made possible by our supporters on Patreon, our YouTube members, and our super thanks donors. Please join them if you can and support the Tank Museum. And thanks for watching. In this video, we're going to take a good look at the Churchill, both inside and out, and at its development, battlefield performance, and also some of the confused thinking that represents British tank design during World War II. British pre-war tank doctrine divided tanks into different categories, light tanks, infantry tanks, and cruiser tanks. In all honesty, this resulted in some pretty appalling designs. While the army was left without a single halfway decent medium tank capable of fulfilling a variety of roles as needed. The infantry tank, as the name suggests, was there to support infantry. It didn't need to be particularly fast, but it did need to be able to take a battery. Infantry tanks already in existence included the Matilda 1 and 2 and the Vickers Valentine. We may only have had two pounders, but we knew how to use them. To complement these, in early 1940, a contract was awarded to the Belfast firm of Harland and Wolfe to develop a prototype of a new heavy tank, the A-20. The A-20 was termed a Char de Fortresse, and a bit like the French Char B-1 Bis, it was designed to operate against fixed fortifications, a sort of First World War scenario. It was to have either a six-pounder or possibly a French 75mm gun in the hull, but to begin with, it was trialled with a Matilda II turret fitted with a British two-pounder. After the fall of France in June, it was obvious there wasn't going to be a trench war to fight, so the A20 project was cancelled. This episode really shows the muddled thinking that British tank development was full of before and actually during the war. But this project didn't go entirely to waste. Vauxhall Motors, who'd worked with Harland and Wolfe developing the suspension and an engine, the 12-cylinder Bedford Twin Six, salvaged the work that had been done on these, as well as the general shape and layout of the A20, and took these forwards into the prototype A22 which would be a more conventional infantry tank following on from the Valentine. The Churchill, as it became known following the Prime Minister's keen interest in the project, is very different to just about every other tank of the period. It went through a good deal of development during its service, eight different marks plus specialist vehicles, and even a super Churchill, the Black Prince, that we'll look at later. This is a Mark II. Uh, it's the oldest in our collection. It's one of 1,127 that were built. Um, if it does look a bit rough, that's because it spent several decades in a forest near Harrogate in Yorkshire, uh, where it was abandoned after it got bogged down. This is probably a good point to go through the external features of Churchill and really sort of look at what makes it different from other World War II tanks. First of all, the tracks and suspension. The tracks wrap all around the hull with an idler wheel and track tensioner at the front and the sprocket wheel at the back. There are 11 pairs of twin bogey road wheels on each side, each with its own coil spring suspension unit. And the front and rear pairs are slightly raised. This is the exact opposite of something like Christie's suspension, big wheels and big springs, the type fitted to the Comet or the T-34. But as an infantry tank, the Churchill wasn't built for speed, and the wheel and track arrangement did contribute to excellent climbing ability. Also, because the suspension units are quite small, unlike most tanks, the Churchill can have side doors fitted, which is helpful for resupply and evacuation. The other part of the mobility equation 
is the Bedford 350 horsepower uh, twin six engine. Now what that is, is essentially it's two six cylinder Bedford lorry engines put together in a flat 12 configuration with a single crankshaft. Then we have the Merritt Brown triple differential transmission. Transmission was a very sophisticated design. It allowed the steering tank by varying the power to each track, and it was capable of a neutral turn. Pretty common today, but it was unusual in 1942. The problem was that the Merritt Brown was rushed into production with practically no testing, and it was horribly unreliable to start with. I once spoke to a Remy veteran who had got bitter memories of the winter of 1942, changing gearboxes in Churchill's on Salisbury Plain, using branches of trees as makeshift cranes. The fact that the turret sits in the middle of the tracks rather than on a raised hull limited the size of the turret ring to a diameter of 54 inches. But in spite of this, different marks of Churchill were able to mount all the principal British tank guns of the war. The two-pounder, six-pounder, and 75 millimeter, only being defeated by the 17 pounder, which was far too big. The turret of this Churchill Mark II is a single piece casting. That's actually quite difficult to do. And um, at the time, riveted construction is predominating. Now the reason for that is that there was a suspicion that welded turrets wouldn't be able to withstand around. That is disproved by testing and the successor to this one, which is the Mark III Churchill, has a turret of welded construction. Here at the front, you can see one of the Churchill's best qualities. Now, the basic glassy plate here is 102 millimetres thick, and that's slightly thicker than uh, the glassy on the Tiger I. In the Mark VII, later on, it's beefed up to 152 millimetres. Now that's an extraordinary degree of protection. A Churchill crewman wrote after action. I walked right round and counted seven direct hits on the front, none of which had penetrated. One shot was jammed almost dead centre of the driver's visor. As I said, this is a Mark II, but the principal difference between this and the Mark I is that this aperture in the Mark I was used to mount a three inch howitzer. Um, if any of you remember this tank from when it was outside the museum a few years ago, it was mocked up with a false barrel to resemble a Mark I. The three inch howitzer was mainly designed to fire smoke, although a very rare HE round was produced for it. Laying a smoke screen could be quite useful in an infantry tank, but because it's so low down, very limited traverse and elevation, it wasn't a lot of use on the Churchill. The idea was to replace close support tanks, uh, which could only really fire smoke shells, with something that was a bit more versatile. A close support tank as a concept um, really didn't survive the realities of war. The weapon itself was in short supply as well, so in the Mark II it was replaced by a Bisa machine gun. Probably a good thing. As a tank which was in service from mid-1942 right up to the end of the war, the Churchill's main armament did need upgrading. Now, this gun, which is the QF two pounder, was fine for that early period. The Mark I APT shell, it's got a muzzle velocity of 792 meters a second, and it can penetrate up to 40 millimeters of armor at 1,000 meters. That was good enough for the early German armor, Panzer I, II, III, even the early Panzer IVs. Um, but it certainly wasn't good enough to deal with later, heavier tanks. And its HE capability was next to useless. In all honesty, by the time that was fitted to the Churchill, it was just about obsolete. Now, before we move on, another peculiarity of the Churchill uh, is this thing here. Now, this is actually the air intake for the engine. And in this early model, it actually points down to the ground. Now that is disastrous 
If you imagine this tank going along, tracks churning muck up, it's all going straight into there, fouling the engine. I don't know whose brilliant idea that was, but it was an absolute stinker. Going back to armament, this Mark IV is fitted with the uh, Ordnance QF six-pounder gun. That's a huge improvement on the two-pounder, and it was fitted to the Marks three and four Churchills. The round will penetrate up to 89 millimetres of armour at 1,000 metres, and it could fire HE. This was better, but still not brilliant. Because of the small size of the round, just 57 millimetres, the high explosive load was not that effective, which is a problem in what is supposed to be an infantry support tank. This Mark IV was converted from either a Mark I or a Mark II. Now, this happens with Churchill's quite a lot, and a lot of it's carried out as part of what we call the rework programme. Now, I haven't got time to go through all the changes and modifications that are put in place here, but Vauxhall Motors, the original makers, actually stopped producing new tanks for a time in order to concentrate on it. It solved a whole host of problems. Now, some of the changes are fairly simple. Better internal lighting, um, tilting periscopes at the front for the driver and the bow machine gunner so they can actually see over the mud guards. Better ammunition stowage inside. But there's also a whole host of other mechanical changes and amendments that produce what is effectively a much better tank. Most obvious from the outside, full mud guards were fitted over the tracks. And that's quite a blessing when you consider the amount of mud and dust thrown up at speed, which made it impossible for the crew to see or steer. Engine ventilation was dealt with as well, the air intakes being directed upwards. All in all, the rework programme represents probably the most comprehensive upgrade and problem-solving exercise any tank at any time. And by the end of it, the British Army has got a tank which is fightable and it's really about as reliable as any tank can be. The last problem to solve, though, is the main armament. If we look at this 1945 Mark VII, the very last of 5,640 Churchills built, you can see the solution. The Ordnance QF 75mm gun. The US manufactured M3 75mm gun appealed to the British Army. It fired a better HE round than the six-pounder, and its armour-piercing performance wasn't too shabby for the mid-war period. The M3 was fitted to both the Grant and the Sherman, and in early 1944, at a British workshop in North Africa, 75mm guns, which had been salvaged off damaged Shermans, were fitted to Churchill's. The result was called the NA-75, North Africa 75. Uh, it was an improvisation. Only about 200 were built, but for troops fighting in Italy, 1944, 1945, they are never at the forefront when it comes to handing out new kit. So these things are extremely useful. The Churchill has so far been upgunned twice. The Mark V and Mark VIII would might need 95 mm howitzer as close support tanks. But one bizarre design flaw remained, the internal mantlet. In the vast majority of tanks, the gun mantlet, the protective shield around the barrel, is on the outside. But in the Churchill, it's inside. The gap you can see around the barrel acts as a shot trap, and even small arms rounds would disintegrate and send spall, nasty little metallic fragments, into the tank. So that's the exterior, and we've given you an idea of the developmental stages. Let's take a look inside. Where I am now, this is the forward compartment of the Churchill. I'm sitting in the bow machine gunner's position, and this is the driver's position. It is that slightly unusual thing. It, it feels quite roomy in here compared to the vast majority of tanks. And we're actually filming through the uh, side access hatch, which again is something you, you don't encounter very often. Um, in front of me here, this is the mount and the sight for the Bisa machine gun with a brow pad. Um, it is really rather nicely traversable. Um, my one misgiving about this is having your ear about three centimetres away from the working parts of a machine gun is not going to be a pleasant experience. I presume they were wearing um, ear pads or something like that. Um, 
both sides have got movable periscopes. That is necessary in order to be able to see sideways because of course the tracks and the mud guards go forward of this position. The other comforting thing is I'm looking out here and we have got this huge slab of um, frontal armour so that would give you a certain amount of confidence. Driver's position, his pedals, uh, gear stick, his instrument panel and then the T-bar steering. Now that is really rather good because if you remember this is Merritt Brown triple differential gearing. Um, you can actually steer the tank by varying the power to each track uh, at a time and which is unusual for a tank of this period, the thing will do a neutral turn. If it's sitting in neutral, one track goes forward, one track goes back, and she turns at her own length. Where I am now, I'm, I'm sitting in the gunner's position. Uh, behind me would be the tank commander, and then over on the right is the loader. Um, immediately here on my right-hand side is the breech of the six-pounder gun, and then behind that is a recoil cage, and that pretty well cuts the turret in two. And then below that, there is a canvas bag to catch the spent cases. Um, gunner's controls up here is his gun sight. Uh, he's also got the mount for the Beesa machine gun, and then ammunition stowage over here in the left-hand corner. He then got hand traverse and power traverse for the turret and the elevation controls. Looking at the turret, the other side of the gun breech, um, this is the loader's position. Um, down below him are what we call the, the ready racks, so ammunition storage for quick access. Um, and then up in the roof of the turret, he has got a traversable periscope and a fitting. I'm afraid the um, object itself is missing. That's the fitting for the two inch bomb thrower. Um, now that was designed to provide um, smokescreen for troops outside. Uh, they had some problems with that because the two inch bombs themselves are white phosphorus. They were initially, the early marks, they're stored just in a, effectively an open tray inside the turret. If those are hit by fragments and they go off inside the turret, I mean, burning white phosphorus in this space really doesn't bear thinking about. Up above me is the commander's hatch, circular uh, traversable hatch with a periscope fitting in this edge. And then you have got the loader's hatch over on the other side. The first combat use of the Churchill, a mix of Mark 1s, 2s and 3s, happened during the Dieppe Raid of the 19th of August 1942. 29 Churchills of the Canadian Calgary Regiment, two were lost on launching, 10 failed to get off the beach, and the remaining 15 were stopped by anti-tank obstacles before reaching the town. German evaluation of Churchill's captured at Dieppe suggested that they were undergunned and under-armoured. But in spite of that, Captain Lawrence Alexander wrote that the tanks stood up exceptionally well and did terrific damage to the Germans. In late 1942, six Churchill Threes took part in the Second Battle of El Alamein as part of a unit called King Force. The CO's tank, that of Major King, Gloucestershire Hussars, fired 46 pounder rounds and was hit six times by a mix of 50mm and 75mm AP, none of which penetrated. A tribute to the Churchill's huge armour protection. As the war in North Africa continues into 1943, six Churchill regiments, making up 21st and 25th Army Tank Brigades, begin to show what the Churchill is really capable of. On the 5th of February 1943, two Churchills from 51 RTR, commanded by Captain E.D. Hollands and Lieutenant J.G. Renton, charged down an 88mm gun across 1,500 yards of open country. And then having climbed a hill, they knocked out two more 88s, two 50mm anti-tank guns, two Panzer threes, and destroyed 25 other vehicles. In Italy, with its profusion of mountainous areas, the Churchill came into its own. During the assault on the Gothic line, Major Peter Vaux wrote that 25th Tank Brigade 
were able to get into places in the mountains that nothing could get to. There were places where the Churchills could only be resupplied by mules. The Churchill was slow. Its top speed was only about 18 miles an hour, but it could cope with the thick mud of an Italian winter. And its superb cross-country performance meant that it could deal with routes that were thought to be impassable and therefore not defended. In Northwest Europe after D-Day, where the painful lessons of Dieppe had been learnt and applied, Churchill gun tanks, mostly Mark IVs and Mark VII's, continued to give good service. But the versatility of the platform was also demonstrated with a variety of specialised vehicles. The Churchill Crocodile carried a flame gun in place of its hull Bisa machine gun, along with an armoured trailer of flame fuel and pressurised gas propellant. This terrifying weapon could discharge a jet of liquid flame up to 150 yards. The Churchill Avery, armoured vehicle Royal Engineers, carried a petard mortar capable of firing a flying dustbin of 28 pounds of HE over 100 yards to destroy obstacles. The same vehicle could also deploy a fascine, a bundle of wood which could be dropped into an anti-tank ditch. It can act as a bridge layer or, using a bobbin, unroll matting to enable other vehicles to cross soft areas, particularly on beaches. We haven't time to go through all of the Churchill's amazing Swiss Army knife-like qualities, and I do want to have a proper look at the specialised tanks of 79th Armoured, the ones they call the Funnies, in another video. But before we leave the Churchill, I want to have a look at two prototypes. The first is this, and this rather sorry looking range wreck is all that's left of a Churchill three inch gun carrier. Uh, now this was built as effectively a tank destroyer uh, based around a three inch anti-aircraft gun. Only 50 were built and the project was never continued with, they never saw active service. What we have here, we think is probably the only survivor and it was uh, bought in off lid ranges in the 1990s. Finally, the end of the line, the Tank Infantry Black Prince A43. Uh, this was designed as a successor to the Churchill. It's bigger, it's 10 tonnes heavier, and it mounts the 17 pounder gun. These come out in May 1945, uh, by which time the Firefly and the Comet are already in battlefield service, and the Centurion has entered production. All three carried the 17 pounder or equivalent, uh, all were faster, and frankly, the Centurion was better in just about every way. The Black Prince project was discontinued and the infantry tank in the British Army had really reached the end of the line. The Churchill was one of the most unusual and adaptable tanks to sea service in World War II. Born out of a degree of developmental confusion, untested and initially plagued with mechanical problems, it later proved itself for its outstanding mobility and ability to withstand damage. The Churchill was the infantryman's friend on the battlefield, but also as an Avery, Arv, Crocodile, and in other guises, showed itself to be one of the most flexible platforms of World War II, and even after. Churchills also saw limited service in the Korean War of the 1950s. To go back to my opening phrase, it started badly, but ended well. Thanks for watching. We do hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like and subscribe. And if you can, support us on Patreon.